understand. Okay, welcome everyone to the final panel to, of the day on incentivizing reform. I'm Professor Melissa Scanlon. I'm a, the director of the New Economy Law Center, which is the co-sponsor of the symposium. And I have the privilege of uh, introducing you to my distinguished panel of four speakers. I will just go down the line and introduce them as they're seated, and then they will uh, give, their, give their lecture to you, and we'll open it up to a Q&A, just as we have with uh, the other two panels. So to my immediate uh, left here, I have Professor Victor Flatt. He's a professor at the University of Houston Law School and a distinguished scholar of carbon markets at the University of Houston's Global Energy Management Institute. He is recognized as an expert in environmental law, energy law, and climate change. He has served on the AALS subcommittees on natural resources and environmental law. And he's a member of the ABA section on em Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources Law Congressional Liaison Committee. Last but not least, he was once a summer VLS Distinguished Environmental Scholar, the first summer that I arrived at VLS. Um, and then we have <coughs> Professor Steve Ferry. He is a law professor at Suffolk University Law School. He previously has served as a visiting law professor at Harvard and at Boston University Law School. He served as vice chair of two ABA energy and climate change committees. He's testified as an expert before seven different committees of the US Congress on energy and environmental matters. US presidents, plural, have appointed him to serve on three different uh, national presidential energy boards. And he's the author of seven books and about 100 articles on environmental and energy law. Last but not least, he too was a summer VLS Distinguished mm -hmm. Energy Scholar. Then we have Abigail Wiest. 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 I knew I was going to get that one wrong. <laughs> Abigail Wiest. Um, she is co-founder and CEO of Goods Unite Us. She's a government attorney and progressive politician in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, she was a Dane, a Dane County supervisor until 2015. She has worked at the White House and the US EPA. And her last but not least is that she has a JD from VLS. <laughs> Finally, Christina Banahan is a corporate advisor consulting on environmental, social, and governance matters related to publicly traded companies. She has served as an economic, uh, I'm sorry, an environmental consultant for law firms, and she is a, a, has worked as a climate change fellow for the US Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Last but not least for Christina, she has a JD and a climate law certificate from VLS and was one of my students. So please welcome all of our panelists and uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Vermont Law School and the Vermont Law Review. Um, I actually uh, got to uh, be involved in a symposium with the Vermont Law Review in 2010. Um, I did a, a keynote address where I actually was talking about how we can't make environmental progress without bringing in economic interests and that they need to align for us to make progress. And, and, and uh, Pat Parento challenged me and, and called me Pollyanna-ish, which you know, I, I think I kind of am. Uh, but the problem is, if we don't do something, um, and if we don't in, enlist the private sector, I, I things, it, it seems that our ability to do things by government is, is not going to get us where we need to go. So um, I will start this with a little good news, because we've had, had a lot of bad news. Uh, so instead of the dismal science, I will be the Pollyanna optimist and uh, just tell everyone, uh, related to the last panel, that um, it's, it's great to be able to be, say something good and say something nice about Texas at an environmental event, which is <laughs> very difficult, usually. 
The state of Texas uh, uses more renewable energy than any other state in the country. Um, it, it has 22 gigawatts of wind power, which is more than three times as much as the next highest state. Um, it, at any given time now, and it keeps going up every day, uh, wind produces about 22% of the electricity in Texas, and it peaks, and every year it gets bigger sometime in the winter. This last winter it peaked at 56% of the power in the entire Texas grid. That's for 26 million people came from wind. And Texas has been able to get this onto the grid without disrupting grid management because they've deregulated and they're using demand management devices and all kinds of things. And, and Texas is definitely a red state. And so that is something that I think is positive. So something good can come out of Texas, including the University of Houston. Okay. Uh, so um, examples of the private sector um, taking mitigation and climate change adaptations uh, issues abound. Um, we, we've heard some of these already for many uh, years. Many companies have made commitments to reduce their carbon footprint, including uh, to improve employee recruitment. And in the last several years, we've seen many big tech companies uh, pledge to zero out their greenhouse gas emissions. They've, they're moving distribution centers to states where they can hook up to all renewable power, uh, Iowa, uh, for one, the Dakotas, and to Texas. Though these are important, these corporate decisions do remain individual decisions made by individual companies. And they're responding to public pressure, they're responding to investment pressures, disclosure pressures, all the things we've been hearing about today. But aside from a general economic case to utilize zero greenhouse gas emission electricity, nothing necessarily stops these private sector enterprises from choosing a different path, as some have. So what I wanted to focus on was what I believe to be a, a, a singular private sector's business whose actions with relation to greenhouse gas emissions could leverage private sector responses across a wide range cross-section of the economy, and that is the industry of insurance. Um, many of you may not know insurance is the second largest sector, business sector in the world after only the energy sector. Um, and it has its hands and tentacles throughout uh, every facet of the economy. Um, most actors in the private sector have some sort of insurance, and many times that insurance exists to hedge risks um, and to uh, hedge risks that are also uh, against occurrences that are associated with climate change, such as flooding, drought, or extreme weather events. Um, if insurance companies were able to charge parties to hedge against this climate change risk, then those parties, in turn, would have an incentive to reduce risk from climate in order to reduce the price of the hedging product. So the role of insurance in climate change is that insurance actions could affect climate mitigation and adaptation across all of the private sector. Um, insurance companies also have an incentive to lessen climate change and vulnerability. Uh, here's the headline uh, yesterday to prep for Hurricane Florence, investors sell off insurance stocks. So we've seen a drop in market share value of m all the major insurance companies that insure in the United States uh, simply because of the appearance of Hurricane Florence. Um, and uh, the insurance sector can often work faster than the government because it has an economic incentive to do so. So insurance has been responsible for um, uh, making changes in our society for a long time. Um, insurance isn't the reason we have seat belts. Insurance is the reason that we have fire departments. Insurance is the reason that we have um, other safety devices. Um, with respect to climate, in an area where the government is not involved, insurance companies have been able to digest massive amounts of data to note that the tornado alley is moving eastward over the last 10 years and adjust their actuarial models accordingly. And this was news to NOAA. NOAA had not been able to get that depth of information yet. Um, and this is not just for uh, property insurers. Um, I want to read something or show you something from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners 
climate report. So they started investigating this over 10 years ago, and they note that insurance companies are not only at risk by climate events, but they're at risk because most of the assets that insurance companies control to balance their portfolios are property-based. So even if they're a, a company that sells only life insurance or sells only automobile insurance, their primary business market is at risk if climate change continues to have disproportionate impacts on, uh, on uh, land and land development. Um, so just to kind of catch us up, I've been working on this for a while. Several other folks, Don Hornstein at the University of North Carolina, Sean Hecht at UCLA, um, and, and, and the government itself, NOAA. Private um, research has identified, though, problems, right? Barriers. Barriers to insurance effectively incentivizing the private sector to do a better job of reducing both their greenhouse gas emissions and their risk profile. Well, what are those problems? What's there? Um, and if we get rid of them, are we going to incentivize more reform? So the first and most important problem is government maladaptation. Top of that list is the National Flood Insurance Program. It is uh, not an economically efficient uh, signal to the market about where to build properties. Um, and it is now over $25 billion in the red, uh, and that's just going to keep growing. That doesn't even include Hurricane Harvey losses, which are estimated at $125 billion. Um, in addition to the federal government, we have problems with states. You all may know or may not know that for the most part, insurance is primarily regulated at the state level. They, 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 they tell the insurance companies what products they can offer, they tell them what, what they can sell them for, and if the insurance company wants to do business in that state, it must follow state insurance commissioner requirements. Well, the problem there is most states have required insurers to offer lower cost property insurance in coastal areas and force them to subsidize it with higher cost insurance in automobile, life insurance, non-coastal property areas. So in a state like North Carolina, for instance, you have the wealthy coastal communities, and not all are wealthy, but many are, that are being subsidized to the tune of 75 to 80 percent from the Appalachian counties in the far western part of the state. This is true in Texas. It's true in Massachusetts. It's true in Florida. Almost every single coastal state has kept requiring insurers to keep insuring properties at the coast. Florida, though, it got so bad that many private insurers just simply pulled out because they couldn't sell an insurance product anywhere in the state, and they said, well, we're just not going to do things here. So government maladaptation is a huge problem. The other, one other problem is insurance timelines. Uh, insurance tends to cover, you buy a policy for a year or two years or three years, but to sort of uh, be able to incentivize lowering risk to climate, you want uh, insurance products that could go 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, and again, this is something that is in state agency hands. Um, what is climate change to the business world in insurance? Can you get insurance against climate change? Maybe. Some insurance companies are thinking about it, but then you have to de define what that is, and they've had difficulty doing that. So they've tended to make it parametric, that is, if the rain event is more than 20 inches, or if this happens, or if this happens, we will insure you. Uh, not everybody's had a problem. Reinsurers, these are typically based in Europe, Swiss Re, Munich Re, they actually have been very good at quantifying uh, climate risk around, because they insure around the world. And so they can charge normal insurance companies rates that will incent them to going. Well, what's been going on since we've identified these problems? Some new trends. First, the National Flood Insurance Program, for the first time, announced two months ago that it was beginning to buy reinsurance. Um, that's, a, that's big, because the reinsurance companies will be putting pressure on them to continue to make market changes to their um, insurance. North Carolina pioneered this. North Carolina is the largest purchaser of reinsurance uh, in the global market. Um, we will see how that turns out after Florence. Uh, North Carolina should be much better set uh, with insurers than South Carolina uh, because of this um, buying of the reinsurance. 
We're also seeing that coastal homes are losing value. Um, two studies in the last eight months, $7 billion loss in property value in Virginia, Maryland, and the district, uh, about $12 billion in property loss in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. Um, so we see this. Miami Beach um, has looked at a way of using reinsurance premium rebates to reduce their climate change risk. Um, that is, they've gotten a reinsurer to charge them less money if they take that money and invest it in stabilization and in ways to try to control more of the flooding that comes from this. Here's a picture of the sea level rise. This was in the Washington Post uh, about, I guess, two weeks ago. Um, and so these are the new trends that we are seeing. All right, so we've had problems letting insurance do its job which would be to incentivize better climate change mitigation and adaptation. The reason has primarily been government policy and a few other things. So how do we incentivize reform? What can we do now at this time? Um, this is an old canard, but the only way I think we can do this is through public pressure to change government policy. We're hearing this more and more, so I don't think it's a pipe dream. The desire to lower taxes, um, we know that after Superstorm Sandy, uh, a lot of congressional parties balked at potentially funding the, uh, ins the, insure the, the $65 billion price tag of that. We're still seeing it after Hurricane Harvey. We'll see it again after Hurricane Florence. Um, the public can't keep affording these enormous disasters. So the public is going to continue pressing for changes in the National Flood Insurance Program. The interests are misaligned, for sure, uh, because very strong interests in keeping it low make their voices heard. But for the entire rest of the country, we can't continue to afford this kind of climate change cost. Furthermore, um, as homes continue to lose value, um, as insurance starts to moderate where, what it's willing to insure, you're going to see people having difficulty getting home loans. We're already seeing this in coastal areas. If they can't get home loans, they're either going to be moving out of those areas, um, in other words, they're incentivizing adaptation to climate change, or they're going to demand some additional um, greenhouse gas mitigation measures to try and make things not as bad in the future. So we're gonna have to have public pressure for the National Flood Insurance Program and state regulation changes. We're going to have to have new zoning and building codes, again, in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. Finally, Harris County and the city of Houston adopted aggressive um, building codes. Um, we may need direct insurance action, either through state regulation or monetary incentives. Insurance companies can lower premiums for lower greenhouse gas emissions. Some of the ideas the insurance industry has had uh, are insuring cars that um, that are all electric at a lower rate to incent uh, that as well. Um, the insurance action is doing more damage studies um, and we're seeing that uh, the financial risk disclosure that was discussed in the last panel has also played a role in doing this. So it's not a magic bullet, but I really think the insurance industry does remain a very strong potential tool. If we get government regulation of it correctly, we will have a tool that can press across other sectors of the economy and help with greenhouse gas. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, while Patrick is setting up my slides, it's uh, delightful to be back here. Uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Scanlon, Professor Jones, the Law Review for setting this up. It's always uh, great to be back here. I wanted to say to the people in the back, you may want to move to the front. I actually have brought for my 15 minutes 50 five zero slides. And doing the math, that gives you exactly 17 seconds. And if you sit in the back and blink, you won't see the slope on the curves. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really encourage you to come forward if you'd like to. Um, okay. so. Some optimistic news and then some pessimistic news as to whether the incentives are going to be there uh, in the next year or two for corporations to make the kinds of moves that the private sector needs to do. So uh, basically, if you can see this, electricity is the biggest sector. We saw that this morning. Uh, transportation, I think Noah was talking about this in the last panel. Transportation is not being dealt with very effectively. 
buildings, arguably not enough money, not very effectively. Manufacturing, not as effectively. Um, the good news, well, before I get to the good news, how about some Trump news here? Um, um, the uh, clean power plan was our move to shut down conventional power, particularly coal, and move to renewables. Uh, the president called this to to totally disastrous, uh, job-killing, wealth-knocking out, which is not a complete sentence, but that's okay. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I think Mark earlier talked about Syria. Syria and the U.S. were the only two nations that had national status, which were not part of the Paris Agreement, uh, and uh, Syria has now joined. So we have a distinction here. Um, and is that going to make uh, enough of a difference or not? So again, we can't withdraw from the Paris Agreement for another four years. That'll be another uh, presidential administration. But our pulling out obviously has called a lot, caused a lot of tension internationally here. So um, again, what was the Clean Power Plan? I want to highlight what you'll see highlighted on this slide, what I've bolded. Clean Power Plan was expected from uh, 1920, uh, 2022 to uh, 2030 to cost between five and eight billion dollars a year. Uh, I, wonder, I want you to remember that number. The, um, the, the uh, estimate in the Obama administration is that the gains were greater than that. In the Trump administration, they do not count international benefits because U.S. law has no effect internationally, and they don't affect things other than CO2 reductions, which is all it directly affects, and the benefits are down to three billion in the most recent calculation. Uh, so the EPA uh, last month decided to start replacement of the Clean Power Plan, which is our <clears throat> major climate initiative. So the idea is we're going over a cliff. In the power sector, exactly the opposite is true when you look at the data. This hasn't gotten a lot of press yet. But again, uh, we were supposed to only be 8% below 2005 emission levels uh, without the Clean Power Plan. Our Paris Agreement goal, if we were still part of it, would be a 26 to 28 percent reduction in carbon. Um, I just saw an article two days ago, a law professor's article, that says the volume of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases emitted to the atmosphere by human activity has continued to increase. That is not true in the United States. It is true internationally. Uh, but where are we on this? Um, we basically have hit the Paris Agreement pledges of the United States today. Uh, seven years before they're required for the power sector. The power sector is down 26 to 28 percent. It's down 28 percent, which is the Paris pledge uh, for the U.S., and it's down before the 2025 pledge. Now, it's down there largely by corporate action, individual action, and state action, but we're going to lose critical uh, federal incentives that I want to get to. And again, if you want to see this graphically from the back, we are down in 2018. Uh, 28 percent, and uh, we may even hit 32 percent, which was the Clean Power Plan U.S. Uh, goal by 2030, even beyond Paris. So the power sector is doing well. This is only the power sector. Power sector is important. Buildings are important because they last forever. The power sector is the third longest uh, uh, investment of infrastructure in the U.S. and the world. So it's important that we deal with all these, but particularly uh, power. Let me just go back here. Go back. Come up. There it is. Okay. It's a slide I just added this morning. This was released two days ago by Governor Brown in California and Michael Bloomberg for the climate summit that is going on out there. Um, we need to reduce all the carbon in the top, uh, you know, from the top uh, blue and, and yellow uh, base down. The yellow base is more than 50 percent, and that's the power sector. Their goal as to how we do this in the California release two days ago is that we get about 60 percent of this from the power sector, almost nothing from buildings, almost nothing from manufacturing, almost nothing from transportation uh, relative to those being big shares. Can we do this? Yes. Will we do this? It's an interesting question, I think. So I'm going to skip these two slides in the interest of time. Uh, the only point I want to make here is that uh, environmental impact statements used to look at carbon. Now with the new administration, they're not looking at carbon or in the process of not looking at carbon impacts anymore. And let me skip over that, although California, at the bottom of this slide, I note that California has preempted all of its local zoning laws so that regardless of how much land you need for a dwelling, you can put an accessory second dwelling on any property, uh, and that cannot be restricted by local zoning. So they're going to try to infill, which has transportation implications, if we infill. I don't know whether it's good or bad, but it's quite, quite innovative. Uh, let me. Let me uh, skip over my NEPA slides, ask questions about that later if you want to. 
Um, we are still spending more money, even in the current administration, on clean power investments, private clean power investments, than we were before. So these are businesses and agencies that are doing more than in 2017. So these are years going across, and we're doing more. Uh, there's an argument here that this may make a bit of a U-turn here. Um, corporations make a difference. Again, I'm going to skip these slides. Walmart is doing a lot. Anheuser-Busch, which is now owned by a Belgian company, is doing a lot. That reminds you of the reception coming up, but this was Anheuser-Busch. I don't want to stand between you and the refreshments here. But basically, a lot of companies, Google, uh, Apple, a lot are buying clean power. I'm going to skip over that because I think that's been mentioned today. Why is solar important? Solar is important for a lot of reasons, but these are the areas that are transmission constrained. A good deal of the East Coast, almost up Route uh, 89 here, and uh, California are very transmission constrained to get more power in from outside over the lines. There is zero federal authority to site transmission lines. States have to do it. A number of states on the East Coast have blocked transmission coming through them, most recently New Hampshire. Uh, blocked more hydropower coming through New Hampshire down to Connecticut and Massachusetts. So without state authority, without states being uh, induced to do so, we can't move electricity. The good thing about solar is unlike the wind, which is not shown on this map, which is up in Maine and Vermont and places that get good wind, solar is where the people are. It's on rooftops in Massachusetts and Connecticut in large amounts. So solar is really important because of the transmission constraints which are embedded and probably insoluble in federal law that any state can stop being a conduit for other states for more electric capacity. So in any case, um, wind power is, uh, in 2012, became the most uh, new capacity added. 43% uh, of new power added in 2012 was wind. Photovoltaic panels have dramatically increased by 60%. It's growing at a very fast rate. But caveat, bottom of this slide, and sorry for going so quickly, the tax laws are changing, and what people think are positive laws for corporations are actually going to hurt renewables uh, significantly. So let me go into the corporate tax law for just a couple of minutes. Let me back up. I think I double, double click there. Okay. So basically, the corporate tax rate has gone from a top marginal rate of 35 percent this year down to 21 percent. And everybody says, well, that's good because corporations now have more money. The question is out there, and you see the newscasts, will they raise salaries, will they buy back their stock, uh, will they put on renewable energy, or will they do something else with it? The incentives are diminishing for renewable energy. The depreciation deductions are not worth as much. There's no longer a corporate minim alternative minimum tax. I ask questions if you, if you want on these. I'm just going to go quickly to get it all in. Uh, business deductions are capped. And so um, there are two credits that have caused most of the renewable power to come in, the production tax credit and the investment tax credit. These are federal tax credit. Production tax credit is largely used by wind power. It adds 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour for each uh, kilowatt hour of wind power that's generated. Uh, since the power in New England has been worth about 3.5 cents, being liberal, an extra 2.4 cents is a huge increase uh, for doing that. The production tax credit is phasing down and out. It was phased out, down and out during the Obama administration, not the Trump administration. Um, this is responsible for making wind cheaper than gas-fired power. Wind is close, but it's still not going to dominate over certain fossil uh, generation. So corporations acting both as producers and consumers have, in have had incentives for wind. And from 27 onward, the, tr the, the, the credit ramps down 20% a year until it phases out. If you don't get the uh, construction begun by uh, basically, uh, what is it, next year, it's 20, 2019. The investment tax credit is a federal tax credit used by solar. It is also phasing out. That gives you 30% of your investment back as a check from the federal uh, government in the first year. Uh, solar is very capital intensive, and so that's incentivized a lot of the solar for corporations. It's going to go from 30% to 10%. It's going to lose two-thirds of its value. And if you don't get that in the ground by 2020, or get, get it started by 2020, uh, that is gone and has not been re-incentivized. Uh, re so what happens with the clean power plan and with, if you act in the next year or two from the production tax credit and investment tax credit, below the middle line, coal is going to decrease because coal is no longer economic. It's going down. But on the left chart, if the clean power plan is there, it's all um, natural gas-fired power that comes in with the clean power plan. 
Without the clean power plan, if the two tax credits that are going away were still there, which they're not going to be, it would be all green renewable power that would uh, get the preference over uh, gas-fired power. With those going away, we're back probably to gas-fired power being the choice. Uh, here's a citation from Merrick Garland, almost went to the Supreme Court. I'm going to skip over it on how, do your tax credits carefully, a decision from last month with a company called Rumpelstiltskin saying they couldn't spin straw into tax credits when they misstated what they were doing. But I'll skip over that. Okay, so there are countervailing tax, uh, tax laws changes here. Looking, instead of being, they're positive for corporations, but they're generally negative for renewable investments by private sector. Uh, wind power is down to 45 cents a megawatt hour with subsidies that's competitive with anything else in the country. Solar's down to 58 cents per kilowatt hour, $58 per megawatt hour. That's more or less competitive with anything. Um, but those credits are going away right now or in the next year. Okay, so what is uh, saving this? One thing is the cost of solar is way down. From 1978, it's reduced to 5% its original cost in terms of the panels. Wind power, the same thing. You see wind power diving not quite as much, but substantially. And wind power and solar power from where we are, which is on the left side of this graph, are uh, going to keep going down, but the drop is not that dramatic projected into the future. So we've wrung most of the savings, not all of them, but most of them out of these technologies. And with solar perhaps eventually becoming cheaper than wind. Um, so uh, again, with the PTC and the ITC going out, what's going to substitute for this? Um, states are going to have to substitute for this and maybe some better economics. So let me see. There it goes. Okay. So what are the states doing? The states are doing a lot of different things with this. There are uh, renewable portfolio standards, which were mentioned earlier, in 29 states. They're very different. Ask me questions later, but I won't go into detail because of time. These are the years they were enacted. The top line shows from the 1980s when Iowa did the first one over to uh, just a few years ago, Vermont is on the furthest right on the top there, having a renewable energy credit. On the bottom of this line are all the revisions. So these things are re revised constantly by states, sometimes year by year. Um, these require utilities and competitors to buy a certain portfolio of, of renewable power. These are those uh, 29 states. The ones that are cross-hatched, if you can see it from the back, and the ones that are yellow are ones that give multipliers for in-state power. That is a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause of the Constitution. In the, two, in the few cases where they have been challenged, they've been held to be unconstitutional. So there are some legal issues pending out there as to states being a little bit more careful in certain states. Net metering runs the meter backwards. You get a re near a retail price for the power. It's worth three and a half cents wholesale. You get, uh, if, if uh, you know, I paid 26 cents a kilowatt hour at the Boston Edison. Uh, I would get something close to 26 cents a kilowatt hour for power that the utility uh, thinks is worth roughly three cents. That is a tremendous incentive. Um, so uh, here, here's the problem. I've only got a couple minutes left here. This is the value of power. It goes in New England uh, for anywhere from zero cents to about four cents a kilowatt hour, depending on the time of day in the month. Power is quite cheap. The cost in 2015 for these state incentives was already $3 billion, with a B, per year. And it's come up three years since then. So there's an interesting question as to how states will trade off the costs of these vis-a-vis -vis the incentives these provide. This is the same graph you saw before. If the California and Michael Bloomberg uh, scenario is that we do this all in the power sector, we're going to have to be extremely aggressive if we're not acting the, asking the other big sectors, uh, transportation, other, other sectors, to do things. I mean, we could do a lot more transportation. It's been a long time since there have been incentives to carpool and other things. So we could do more, but I think that's politically a, more of a hot potato. Uh, here are the costs to rates. Uh, renewable energy credits and net metering have, re have, ca have caused the cost of electricity to rise 11% in California, 8% in Massachusetts, and this data is two or three years old, so it's a little bit behind. So these, again, are not inexpensive on consumer bills and how we do this. Um, this I just saw uh, yesterday. This is an Oxford uh, London Institute saying that uh, European uh, countries have uh, uh, made their, their cost of power go very high and caused problems for their power system over there. So it's a lot to manage. The bottom line here, to wrap up in a couple of slides, is that um, the cost of power, renewable power, uh, when you have excess renewable power and sell it to the grid, now for several hours of the month is negative. 
if you sell renewable power, and again, if Noah were here, he would tell us more, uh, surplus power to the grid, often you have to pay them money for them to take your power because it's backing down other plants that can't go up and down as quickly. They're nuclear, they're coal, and uh, they don't want the power. And if they have to take it, they have to bump something else. So this is uh, Germany and California. California has a lot of hours now where they're paying negative value to take your surplus power. So I guess the argument here is only designed big enough for your factory or your business. Same thing, uh, New England is the second one down under Germany, a fair number of hours where you get same day discounts or negative prices for power. So again, uh, we're supposed to do America first. I've only got two more slides here, so I'll finish up. We're doing pretty well with power in the US. It's an interesting question because of the tax law changes that are generally seen as positive because they lower the corporate rate, don't actually do the opposite and provide disincentives for more renewable power, and it leaves it to the states and falling prices here to keep, uh, keep incentivizing this. What's happening is coal power is going down. The blue line in the middle is US use of, of uh, coal. The red line at the bottom is our export. What we are starting to do, because coal is diminishing very quickly as a use of existing power generation in the US, is we are exporting it uh, big time now. So we're exporting the climate problem with our coal to a lot of other countries. The International Energy Agency says uh, uh, there's going to be a fair bit of coal into the future. And uh, here's where we are exporting coal to, Japan, uh, China, India, China and India were not covered by the Kyoto Protocol, any mandatory requirements. So it's an interesting uh, export scenario. So uh, I'll remain, anything else for questions and answers? Uh, thank you to, for listening to Victor and me, and I'll uh, pass it over to Abigail now. Well, thank you to, to Vermont Law School for having me. Um, and uh, my name is Abigail Wiest. I am an alum from Vermont Law School from 2004. Um, and I'm proof that there's jobs out there. Um, I've had a lot of different kinds of them. And um, we've heard a lot today about um, very specific data and policies regarding, to cl regarding climate change and corporations and how the two interact. Uh, I'm kind of here on a much, with a n much narrower base of knowledge to give you kind of an example or a case study of um, a way that a company can help incentivize other companies to act more in the public interest versus the private interest, um, the private corporate interest. Um, so I'm gonna start out by just kind of asking you guys, how many of you own New Balance shoes? Do any of you own New Balance shoes? Or this is Vermont too. Uh, what about Chaco's or Tiva's? Yeah, so all those companies donate to the GOP predominantly. And in the case of New Balance, New Balance donates at a very high rate to um, GOP PACs and politicians. Um, and I'm saying this as kind of a segue into who, who I am and who our company is. Our company is called Goods Unite Us, and we were formed, my husband and I started the company kind of in a response to the last political election, and also kind of the whole political climate in the wake of the Citizens United decision, which we've all grown to know a lot about. And I think after the last political election, we felt like we needed to do something, and one way we thought we needed to do it was to try to incentivize, figure out a way, as we're progressives, but we really believe the goal of the company is kind of a nonpartisan goal of transparency and getting money out of politics. So we really wanted to find a way to more effectively live with the post-Citizens United world that we live in. And, and how this kind of relates to the topic at hand is um, it's an example of a company, uh, how we can use um, our purchasing powers and our, con and our consumerism as a way to incentivize companies to act in the public good. And in order to kind of live in this, this world where there is money in politics, we realized that we needed, especially as progressives, but from both sides of the aisle, we need to figure out ways to not let the existence of so much corporate and private money in politics dilute our vote to the extent that our purchases are right now very actively undermining your votes. Um, one example I'll give you is like the New Balance shoes. Um, a lot of you, you know, might believe very heavily in, um, 
environmentalism, um, you know, um, human rights, all sorts of wonderful things, unions, um, and your purchases are going towards a shoe company that then is turning around and giving lots of money to elect politicians that are enacting laws that go against your interests. And I will, um, Professor uh, Ferry mentioned um, Anheuser-Busch doing some good things. And Anheuser-Busch is a good example of how a company can be doing some good things using, I think it was wind energy, um, which is great. But then they are also um, a company that donates very large amounts of money to the GOP. And so, in effect, what they are doing is is e helping elect a lot of the people that are putting in place the laws that then make renewables harder. Um, the administration is gutting the analysis um, under NEPA and all the things that we're, we've kind of been talking about today. So Goods Unitas is a company that's kind of trying to figure out a way to not get into the individual s social issues, but figure out a way to help protect the integrity of the democratic process and the strength of our individual votes with the existence and the reality of corporate money in politics. And the way that we kind of figured about doing this was kind of to try to be a company that sheds some light and transparency on how corporate money, um, how corporations are exercising um, their protected speech, which they got under Citizens United. And so what the company does, and we have an app, it's a great app, it's called Goods Unite Us, and it's free. And it allows you to kind of do a background check on all sorts of your favorite companies, and you can just Put in, there's even categories, so you can go to beers, and you'll see the Anheuser-Busch is maybe not who you want to purchase your beer from if you care about certain things. Um, and what it is, is the, the goal is kind of twofold. One, it's to create transparency in a nonpartisan fashion, create transparency on how corporate money is affecting the political process. And two, allow individuals to be slightly more savvy, more accurate political consumers. Um, and so we are not diluting our vote by uh, going out and then buying products that are gonna be um, funneling their proceeds for those products into um, PACs and, and uh, politicians that really undermine the values that we have that we're trying to express at the voting booth. So that's kind of the idea of who we are. And you can kind of, you can, we, have, we have an app and a website and that's our ideal. Um, and, and why we're trying to do it, um, I think we get lots of questions from people saying, well, isn't this gonna be polarizing? Isn't this gonna be something that, that, that tears people apart? And, and, and my answer is, we hope not, and we don't think eventually it will. I think that one way that we can start incentivizing corporations to act beyond themselves and for the public good um, is by increasing transparency purely on how, how they are acting. And I think that especially in the, the wake of Citizens United where we are going to give corporations this, this, this special status as a, I mean, we call it as a person, but really it's giving them protected speech um, and allowing them to affect elections um, with their big pot, aggregated pot of money. Um, if we're gonna do that, then we wanna know what, com what companies are doing and, and who they're supporting with it. And the idea is that eventually, New Balance might say, hey, our revenues from shoe sales to liberals is way too high to risk. We're just not gonna support all these political candidates um, or these PACs, and we're gonna get out. And so that's kind of our main goal is to try to incentivize corporations to get out of spending corporate money influencing political elections. And uh, so that's kind of, a, that's kind of a, one of the, the big loftier goals of it. Um, and that will take time. But I think at the beginning of that process is really educating consumers on where our money is going. Uh, and then I kind of just want to briefly touch base. Um, this is a law school, so I should mention some case law. Um, uh, the Citizens United decision, which we're all familiar with. I think one of the major reasons we need to, um, when we started this company, from my perspective, one of the, the real reasons why it was needed and, and the change the change that Citizens United really did was it really re it recharacterized and in, in a sense rehabilitated the view of a corporation in society. Um, I think before Citizens United, uh, we have a lot of case law that really was trying to protect society from the effect of corporate money on politics. And what Citizens United does is, is, is really kind of have a whole different 
view of how corporations um, are, you know, what their effect is on the political process. And all of a sudden, the court does not seem to worry about them having a negative effect on the political process. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the critical mistakes, and we're living in that world now. But, but in the past, there was case law that, that was m much more concerned with the, the effect of having corporations with their big aggregated funds of, of money. They have these big pots of money that they get from all these different sources. And then they are using them in a way that does not directly reflect the views or ideals of, of the sources of that money. Um, so that's kind of where we enter, kind of saying, OK, well, maybe we need to start companies um, thinking about that, thinking twice before they enter the political process. And if they want to stay engaged, they can do so. And on our site, we're going to be having, um, having pages that com companies can have a back end into and justify their political actions if they do want to remain political. Um, so, you know, New Balance can come in and say, hey, or All American Made, and then people can have a discussion about that. Um, so, knowledge is power, uh, as they say, and, and, and that's kind of, our, our main goal is transparency. Our ultimate goal would be also to, to, to try to get money to kind of come out. Um, so, so that's kind of why I'm here, is just kind of give an example of that, in, that, that action, in, and I think that it is, we are a good example of how corporations um, can also be used to incentivize other corporations to do the right thing. Um, and I think we're really seeing, we're, we're not a B Corp yet, but we do plan to become a B Corporation, a benefit corporation. Um, I think that really directly aligns with our philosophy, which is that a company can still make money um, while doing the right thing. And there's a, there's a beauty to the idea of having your, your basic founding documents ensure that you keep in mind society and, and, the, and, and the interest of, of the public. So, so that's our goal, and I'll save the rest for uh, during discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Great. Well, first of all, thank you, um, Vermont, and my future colleagues for allowing me to speak, uh, share a little bit of the knowledge that I've acquired since graduating in 2015 from Vermont Law. Um, I've been assured by the organizers that none of you have uh, rotten tomatoes to throw at me, so that's very comforting. Um, so bear with me, I'll try to run through this as quickly as possible so we can get through the refresh to the refreshment portion of the evening. Uh, but really my goal is to explain a little bit how corporations make decisions. I work mostly on day to day with CEOs and CFOs trying to disclose their climate change risk or working on their ESG disclosure otherwise. Uh, so I'll walk through how some of these decisions are made and what opportunities there are for us as environmentalists. So before I get into the thick of it, uh, indulge me for a second. Uh, I wanted to explain uh, a corporate, the corporate structure. So corporations function in a lot of in a very similar way to how our government works. You have the executive branch or management that is on one side that is dealing with the day-to-day -day issues, and then on the other side, you have Congress or the board of directors that's representing constituents or investors. Uh, and investors come in different ways. They come as asset owners, asset managers, and your run-of-the-mill retiree investor in Florida that is out fishing and just waiting to have that compound interest. So board of directors have to make decisions for all these different kinds of investors. And CEOs, on, CEOs and CFOs and management generally 
are on the other side managing the different kinds of, of issues that happen on the everyday. So there are three broad areas that motivate um, how a corporation makes decisions. Uh, these three competing priorities are financial considerations or the profit, profitability of a company, so the long-term revenue, the short-term revenue, and compensation of these parties. Uh, then there's the indirect pressure that companies like Abigail's can exert on these different corporations, so um, potential reputational risks that companies may face if information comes out that they're using child labor or they are polluting the environment. So that is a potential cost to a corporation. Uh, another indirect way that companies can be influenced is through uh, competition through peers. So if a peer is a leader in this segment and they are uh, deciding that the best practice is to disclose all of their climate change risks, then, then that is the industry standard. And so companies that fall below that may be viewed as laggers, and nobody wants to be viewed as a lagger. Um, and then the last piece of it is this direct pressure that can be exerted from governments and through litigation, which is what we think of a lot of the time within the law school. Great. So why do companies care about climate change? So companies care about climate change primarily for four reasons. They care about it because the definition of risk has now become, has now come to include environmental, social, and governance risks, which climate change is a part of. The second one is that companies may face potential against vote recommendations for their board if they're unresponsive to shareholder desires. If, as we were mentioning before, third, the potential perception of a company being a lagger or being uncompetitive is also a concern. And lastly, we've begun to see this trend in, in shareholder proposals seeking to link environmental and sustainability to an executive CEO compensation. And you can imagine how they feel about that. Not great. Um, <laughs> So those are some of the things that companies are, are considering when they're thinking about climate change and ESG risks. So shareholders, in turn, care about climate change because they're invested in a company for the long term. They uh, are putting this money in the pot because they want to grow um, their investment throughout time so that they can retire and have money. That's your average Joe Schmo purpose for investing. So this conception of uh, investing this long-term interest has led, is, is parallel to our interest in addressing climate change because if we don't address climate change in the long term, then potentially in the long term, this long term, sorry, that's very redundant, but the long term potential risk is that the investment uh, won't be good. So we've seen this happen in a couple of different ways, which I won't get into, but um, four ways that company, that investors have let companies know that they're interested in more climate change disclosure is through divesting from fossil fuels, movements from uh, private educational institutions and governments, uh, request, divesting from fossil fuel companies. Non-binding proposals is another way that has become increasingly common that shareholders have started to engage with companies. In fact, uh, this year is the year where we've seen the most shareholder proposals uh, get filed and receive majority support. Um, we, 
It doesn't sound like a lot, but we got four shareholder proposals with majority support on climate change, which is a big deal. Um, third, uh, the third way is investors have become more vocal in the way that they talk about climate change risk um, and their desire for more disclosure. Uh, Larry, Flink, Larry Fink from BlackRock kind of caused a big uproar when he said that corporations, he's the CEO of BlackRock, by the way, um, it owns trillions of dollars in investments. And he made waves when he said that corporations had to do more than just provide profits. They needed to contribute to society some way. And that was a big wake-up call for a lot of corporations. And um, because of that, a lot of asset managers have begun adopting climate change policies. JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs uh, now consider climate change when voting in annual meetings as part of their considerations. So part of this movement um, from shareholders requesting disclosure has been a longer arc of a trajectory. What started out of, as shareholders just wanting general information on environmental and social issues has now progressed to a more specific request towards having specific scenario analysis, which has been mentioned by some of the other panelists. And this trajectory is kind of interesting because it it shows that investors are not will not be satisfied with just having general general environmental information. Now they're demanding evidence on how the company is preparing for a world that is seeking to reach the two degree scenario. So uh, Hannah covered the task force recommendations on climate change. Uh, I just wanted to lay them out here because they're the best practice market standard for climate change risk disclosure. And uh, we will continue to see investors demand information that is consistent with this standard. Um, a lot of this information is now being collected by an organization called CDP. It was formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. It's accessible to all. And it is interesting because it goes in and it ranks corporate disclosure um, from, it gives grades to companies on the, their disclosure on climate change risk. When we're talking about what constitutes best practice with climate change disclosure, it goes a bit beyond the task force recommendations. So we're looking for disclosure that includes board oversight, that includes um, explaining the long-term impacts of the investments the company is doing today well into 2035 which is a different conception of what a long-term investment has traditionally been understood to be. Um, and then outlining the impacts of fluctuating demands for their, for their products. Um, so, in terms of the disclosure requirements, I'm not going to get too into it because other panelists have, um, have spoken at length about this. But I just wanted to mention that just because in the US, the standard, the climate change disclosure is not required doesn't mean that this is happening everywhere else. As others have mentioned, in the EU and in countries like France, there, is, there are extensive requirements on climate change risk. And what this means is that 
we will see companies, international companies, that will start disclosing all of their climate disclosure for their companies internationally just because it's easier to, a lot of the times, to meet the highest level of burden. So the last slide that I wanted to go through is what are the potential consequences for companies that don't, that just ignore climate change risk. So there are a couple of different ways that this could be bad. So it could be bad because it could lead to proxy contests. It could lead for a board being replaced if the shareholders feel that they're not really being responsive to the request that shareholders have. It could lead to consumer boycotts. It could lead to negative press. Uh, and lastly, it could lead to potential lawsuits that are related to their disclosure. So with that, I will let you all go and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you everyone. So we're gonna open it up to questions right now and uh, we have some mics around the room. I see some hands up. Thank you all. Uh, Victor, you talked about uh, insurance in relation to home buying and home purchasing decisions and movement and potential fleeing, leaving the coastal communities. Can you talk a little bit about the insurance uh, impact or potential impact related to some of the larger facilities and operations of oil and gas companies and chemical facilities that dot the coast, especially in the Houston area? Yeah, um, so a lot of companies, energy companies as well as others, but energy companies tend to be coastal located, particularly their manufacturing or, or industrial bases. Uh, they face, uh, particularly in the Gulf Coast area, they face a great deal of risk uh, from rising seas, um, from storm surges, and, and not just the coastal ones, but also the offshore ones as well. Uh, their pipelines, um, shipping, many other things. Um, many of the largest companies are actually self-insured. So the very largest ones don't usually purchase insurance, although they may go into the risk market to get cat catastrophe bonds or something like that. Um, what they're really trying to do is lobby government to spend money <laughs> to protect them, uh, to build barriers and other things. Um, so they're, I, I kind of consider them somewhat of an outlier from what I hope the insurance industry will do uh, for them. But they, but they face risks like everyone else, and they realize that now. Uh, this one's also for you, Victor. Um, I agree that uh, the, with the insurance companies and thinking about that, but also I feel that the uh, things that the insurance companies cover are more immediate and or like imminent dangers. And then with climate change, I feel there's a spatial disconnect between like, you know, so like it's very ahead in the future and it might not even affect them at all. And so I was just wondering like, how can you incentivize them to invest in this? And like, or do you think that climate change is too high of a risk for them to even consider it? So, so, that's, so that's a very good question. I mean, and I sort of alluded to this when I said, can you um, get insurance for climate change? And, and the, the, the thing I'm really talking about is getting insurance for things that are exacerbated or come from climate change or contributions to climate change. So two examples. Um, let's talk about protecting property. So the biggest climate change risks now are the, that are fairly detailed to climate are drought, which affects agriculture and power plants, um, the uh, uh, wildfires, um, and floods. Those, those three are, are definitely tied into that. And every company wants to minimize their risk. And insurance companies exist for them to push risk to, to pay for someone else to take the risk. But for insurance companies to do that, they have to have a sense of how much they're putting themselves at risk. So they have to have a sense of, you know, actuarially, 
how bad is it going to be in order to price a product? Otherwise, they're not, they're not gonna be in the market at all. Um, and so what we're seeing is insurance companies wanna make money, so they're trying to figure out ways to price products. And the reinsurance companies can do it very well because they, their risk is spread worldwide. Um, domestic companies have a harder time, um, but they are seeing that if they can offer a product now, they can potentially profit from that. So on the one hand, those are people trying to um, protect themselves. Another kind of insurance is um, board insurance. And you were just talking about the danger to corporate boards uh, for decisions that are made. So failure to disclose risk, um, being sued in proxy fights or shareholder fights, um, those, that is encouraging companies to take mitigate, mitigative action, right? To, to say, oh, we realize we're, we're not gonna do this, et cetera. It, it goes back to your point, information means a lot. So to the extent insurance companies to price their own risk and get information from the private companies, it makes, it means the private companies have to generate that information and presumably affect their behavior. So I would say though, yes, climate change is an incredibly long-term risk, but it's also here right now. And so you're seeing it. Sorry. No. Well, actually what I think is gonna happen is that, um, and I think it's somebody pointed this out in the second panel on the Shell scenario planning in 2010, there, there are these multiple hurricanes and people say we're not gonna pay the cost anymore, we're gonna pull out. States are having to decide, you know, they're, they're facing taxpayer revolt as well from their sh insurance regulation. And so what I think it's gonna do in, in, in just, just say in property, you know, homeowner property, is continue to encourage people to not make these big investments in coastal infrastructure. In other words, to move, to start the retreat. A slow retreat, absolutely. But if the insurance isn't there, if they can't get insurance there, you know, only the very wealthiest can build and, and self-insure. Okay, I'm going to ask a question so we can move the spotlight down. Um, so, Christina, you were talking about shareholder resolutions being on this arc. Mm -hmm. um, and in recent years, there have been hundreds of shareholder resolutions at oil and gas companies. And they've had, you know, some success, but the success has been like, uh, and these are resolutions about climate change. As I understand it, the success has been limited to kind of changing some of the um, orientation of the board of directors. What do you, do you see something more that could be accomplished um, with that basic level already having been accomplished? What do you think shareholders could accomplish with specifically oil and gas or coal companies, you know, the ones that are really um, the biggest culprits in causing climate change? Well, you're all about the hard questions today, Melissa. <laughs> Um, besides these informational shareholder um, proposals, there have been some that get into more nuanced, um, nuanced particulars. So one of the ways that one proposal has been um, to set targets for methane and flaring, and that has been just a progression of that um, kind of information disclosure request. But another has been in coal, in coal companies, how for companies to disclose the potential health, environmental health impacts and what, what the plan is of the company to deal with this. And that is as specific as I see it getting because I think shareholders are also concerned that if they get too much into the weeds of what companies should be addressing and not addressing, then they run the risk of the SEC disc um, omitting these proposals because then it gets into the business as usual, the business exception for everyday affairs that um, 
is used quite often to exclude these kinds of proposals. So I think it's kind of a fine line to walk between shareholders wanting more information and wanting to help shape the, the direction of the company, but also not getting into the everyday managing of the company that is reserved to the management and the CEOs. Good to know where that distinction falls. Hi, thank you for being here to speak with us. Um, I have a question for Abigail. Um, so I love the idea of your app. I'm very excited to download it myself. Um, I think um, I think it's a really interesting way to go about making more sustainable consumer decisions. Most of what you were talking about was about tracking where corporate money and corporate decisions are with where their funds go. I'm wondering if you have any intention of trying to incorporate supply chain transparency into on kind of the practices, either the investment practices or the supply chain practices of the companies you're looking at? That's a good question. And and the short answer is no, uh, not at this time. We kind of have had to, we had to kind of very early on define the company pretty narrowly mm -hmm. as going to the top level down, which is the lawmakers, basically. Um, it, it became too big a task to go and honestly a task that, that w with too many variables and too many different opinions on to go after each specific social issue. So uh, so, we, so we don't do that and that would be a, 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 a much grander, much harder thing to police and to, 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 to really get good data on um, and is a lot grayer in a lot of areas. So we're really focused uh, at this point just on political contributions um, and we have you know, good sources of publicly available data on that that we then put lots of time. We have um, employees that take a lot of time and aggregate that data um, and, and, and make it a very usable thing for, for everyday consumers and that's kind of where the app comes in. Um, it would be, you know, I, I myself also see the value in wanting to know how a company performs or acts on very specific social issues too, but that's a, a, a much harder thing to kind of distill down into a user-friendly platform. It's also a little bit beyond our mission because our mission is a little bit more focused on trying to get money out of politics. And, and the idea being this, one time we had, we had a, a commenter who commented on our site about how, yeah, New Balance is, is donating, all, donating all this money to Republicans, but they're made in America and that's what matters to me. And it's a good point, but then my, re my response to that was, that is, America is only as good as it's care about unions, we won't have unions. If you are electing people who don't care about environmental integrity, we won't have an environment that is any better than another country where you know, your shoes might be made. So um, from our perspective, a lot of this power um, and a lot of our power as consumers should be going kind of directly to the top. So that's kind of what our focus is. If I can interject two sure. seconds. If you're interested in kind of exploring a company's supply chain, um, CDP, the climate change disclosure website that I mentioned, also does um, evaluations of companies on um, their supply chain. So you can see their each company's score in that respect and also a, like in-depth report um, for whatever it's worth. And can you say again what that website is? It's CDP. CDP. CDP.com, I think. Yeah, great. Other questions? Hi, um, yeah, thank you for coming. My uh, question's for Professor Ferry. Um, you had mentioned the policy in California of infilling, and historically there's always been kind of um, backlash when zoning or other types of um, decision-making power that's normal at the, normally at the municipal level gets raised up to the state level. So what do you anticipate some of the reactions being? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent uh, question. Yeah, I, I, there, there's been tremendous uh, pushback, there, the other states have, have tried to do similar things. Uh, so for example, Massachusetts, uh, just to the south of us here, a couple of years ago tried to overtake, it, it was very hard to cite wind anywhere in Massachusetts because of community opposition to wind for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, probably the toughest state in New England to cite in. 
And so there was a move to try to exercise state authority over local zoning there. Again, that's not infilling for transportation, which is a, you know, we all, we all, what is it, 76% of trips are single occupancy trips to work, right? So we don't, there, there's more we could do, and I suppose we would if we had to, but we, we don't do. Uh, in the Massachusetts statute, they were, Massachusetts now has to state approve any power facility over 100 megawatts in generating capacity. They were going to lower that to one megawatts or larger for wind, which would take any significant wind turbine of any height, and the state would basically more likely approve that than the local community who was saying move it somewhere else. And that ultimately failed in the legislature. It looked like it was sure to pass, but there was enough local opposition, even that, which is the occasional wind turbine, let alone um, how many, how many uh, uh, boarding houses can my neighbor put on, in their backyard, right? So I think, I think that's a very sensitive issue. And uh, uh, California is the only state that has done that. Massachusetts um, came close last month when the legislation closed to doing something else, which would become the first state to set um, car insurance rates based on the amount of distance driven. So they're saying if you're going to drive long distances, there's going to be a surcharge, not so much from the insurance company, only administered by the insurance company. It comes to the state because you're putting a lot of carbon in the air and maybe that would be an economic incentive. So I think these issues are, are fairly sensitive and I think the federal government is, uh, the federal state issues are sensitive and the, and the state local issues are, are, are sensitive. And, and uh, about half the states also usurp on power plants citing uh, local zoning laws for that, for just general power plants, and that's a sensitive issue. So I think it's all very sensitive. Uh, this question is prof for Professor Ferry. Hi, my name's Travis Clark. I'm a 2L here at Vermont Law School. Uh, earlier in the conversation, you had mentioned that while we are consuming less coal here domestically, we are exporting more coal. I was wondering, uh, based on corporate structures and a long history of exporting around regulations here in the United States, how we can limit the export of coal? That's the first question. And two, and maybe, maybe we could preface with this question is, are we really gaining a net positive by exporting coal? Um, burning coal domestically requires less loading, unloading, less transport costs, and probably burning it in cleaner facilities. Uh, so specifically, is the export market doing a disservice, generally speaking? And as practitioners, how can we attempt to limit corporations from exporting the problem in a way that allows them to navigate around domestic regulations? Yeah, ex excellent question. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that graph, it basically showed, um, I went through it so quickly, but it basically showed the amount of coal not coming down that much in the United States, but the domestic use was coming down significantly, and the export market is going up, and the same thing's happening with our natural gas. We're now exporting frack nat natural gas. Most of the import uh, terminals, which we originally had three, and then I think we went up to about 11, those are now getting licensed for export uh, to Japan and other countries. Um, how do you limit that? It seems to me there's probably no good reason for most countries to be importing and building more coal. The, the coal in the United States has actually become valuable because it has a higher caloric value than some of the foreign coal. So for each ton that you move, you get uh, more BTU of power out of it when you, when you burn it. Um, you know, there have been, um, there's really there's really no reason, given the economics of coal, that, that there are still additional coal plants going up. But China gets a lot of credit for putting up a lot of renewable energy, which it's done. It's also been building until recently one new coal plant a week, uh, which in one year is more than the number of coal plants built by the United Kingdom during the 100 years of the Industrial Revolution. So, I mean, there's a lot of coal going up, a lot of countries, and, and, and you know, China has said it will it will start to it will start to cap the amount of carbon in the atmosphere in 2030, but that's still a fairly long way off. One of the things I've been doing for the last 25 years, uh, when I'm you know summers and spring breaks and, and semesters, is I've been going overseas for the World Bank and the United Nations, and basically um, in a number of countries we break open the utility monopoly, and we allow independent power to come in if it does renewable energy. Um, that has started because all of a sudden renewable power, instead of whether it's small hydro or wind or solar or, or trash to energy, 
it used to be expensive. Now it's really cost competitive. And in a lot of places, a lot of countries, they've not extended the grid to half the population. Instead of trying to, to extend more transmission lines, which are quite expensive, to put the copper up and hope they don't get vandalized or, or stolen, uh, it's easier to put small solar uh, mini grids or, or small mini grids there. And again, those countries have traditionally have not done it because they like the advice. They do it because the World Bank will dangle a half a billion dollars, and so you have to do all these things in return for your next loan or your next grant. But today, there's almost, in the last couple of years, there's almost no reason, and countries are actually for the first time starting to embrace renewable power because it's actually cost effective uh, compared to the other alternatives. So it strikes me that there's no reason that um, uh, there should be, um, you know, many coal plants, uh, coal export, but it's, it's still developing. I, you know, a colleague of mine is developing a $1 billion uh, rail line and port in an Af South African country, which I won't mention, basically for either China or India, whoever makes the highest price, to start to grab one more coal mine in Africa. So it's still being developed, but uh, with a lot of the international organizations which control the money, there's a way to just say stop doing that. The Export-Import Bank in the United States under the Obama administration tried to discourage more coal-fired power plant. That's easing off now with the new administration. So, uh, you know, practically, that, that should be diminishing, and it's not. So I think part of it's education, but again, we don't control a lot of, uh, you know, it's not like corporations in the U.S. where we have some control over some of their disclosures. Uh, these countries, it's more of a, of a, you know, opaque system. But again, I, when you control the money, you can control some of this. You can say, we're just not going to finance more of this and try to at least cap it. And you've got to bring India and China and uh, Indonesia into the, into the fold and convince them that it's cost effective too. If, if I could just add something, you were asking directly what can you do to stop the export, and, and we've seen a lot of local action in states and localities to stop coal export terminals. So in Oregon and Washington, which is where the powder, and British Columbia, which is where the Powder River Basin coal from Wyoming would come out, um, there, you know, there's lawsuits going on about this, but they've tried to prevent any additional coal from, from being exported. Um, and that changes the cost structure uh, as well. The other thing that we could do with a different administration <laughs> is um, stop, uh, you know, leasing federal lands uh, for, for coal extraction. Um, because that's, I mean, our biggest supplies from the federal lands in Wyoming. Everybody talks about West Virginia and Kentucky, but that's, that's not the big game. The big game is in the West, actually. Yeah, and, and both coal mines and natural gas extraction uh, cause methane to escape to the environment. Methane used to be considered about uh, you know, 15 to 25 times more damaging molecule by molecule in terms of, terms of warming. Some new Harvard research, and I think the EPA is... Uh, and uh, the International Energy Agency are adopting this now. It's really 86 to 105 times more damaging in terms of its warming potential. Uh, it, it works in a more concentrated time frame. It lasts for about a decade, and then it starts to dissolve in the atmosphere. So it's, it's just sort of the way they, they did the math in a funny way. But there's actually a Supreme Court case. What, what Victor said uh, just reminded me. There's a Supreme Court case that gets overlooked a lot from more than a decade ago called uh, Norfolk versus Overly where in the United States it was legal for a state to ban a new coal lightering or loading station, uh, even though it was allowing uh, oil offloading, and even though it's probably worse to, spe to, to drop some oil in the water than it is coal, at least coal stays together, whereas the oil you know, disperses. And so you, there is the ability, at least arguably, if you structure it correctly, to, to, to block on a statewide basis or maybe even a municipal basis to, to block certain sorts of loading and offloading fossil fuel facilities if you do it correctly. So this is a, that's a good question with a multi-layered answer. You heard about investments as a lever, local action, federal action if there's a, a different administration. So a lot of different ways to get at it. I'll do a follow-up on this um, with any of you. So what about, in terms of ex the export question, what about the um, fact that tra international transport of something like coal is not, the, the CO2 related to that is not attributed to any country, the way the accounting is set up under the Paris Agreement. So what do you think of changing the accounting system for trans international transportation of goods such a, well, any good, um, but it's coming up here with coal in terms of using that as a lever 
to limit that, the movement of any kind of goods. Well, I would just start by noting, I mean, you, one could do that, right? One could do it with the WTO, um, and certain countries could try to adopt that as an accounting thing, and then the question is, is that allowed under the WTO? And that's not as clear. With energy supplies directly, it is, but the, the ancillary energy you're talking about is not as clear. I would note that moving things by ship is the least carbon intensive way to move. That doesn't mean we should be doing it, but it is. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it would be great. I think that amount of information would be great so you saw the total flows in both directions. Maybe the bottom line is still a more limited look, but I think it would be wonderful to have that information. Um, it sort of goes back to, I think, the uh, cases that Ben was talking about in the prior panel. Um, you know, New York and uh, Oakland and San Francisco have sued somewhat unsuccessfully to date the large um, petroleum companies, the oil and gas companies, saying uh, this is, uh, you know, you didn't disclose it and you're, you're basically a, a, a bad actor in some ways. Um, there also have been issues raised in those cases as to whether it's non-justiciable because those are not the companies that are burning it. We're putting it in our car and we're driving, right? So there's an interesting question as to where our legal system decides to put the pressure. But certainly from an informational point of view, I think that would be excellent if there was a way to do it. Okay. Other questions out there? One more over here. Um, hi, guys. Thank you for coming. Um, I guess mine's a more general question, and it might be a little bit outside of the arc, like the scope of this conversation, but I'd like to know your take on it just because you guys have very different takes on things. So um, if a lot of countries have environmental um, rights essentially installed in their constitution, not a lot, but, you know, they wrote theirs after we did. Um, what is your view on if we had a constitutional right essentially put in to an environment how, however worded and how do you think that would essentially um counteract any t type of like private movement made by these corporations because i kind of think that all of these things we're talking about is a lot of different work in a lot of different areas and there might be a quicker solution but i don't know if it's actually a solution or not so like i just want to know your point of view on that um if that makes any sense. <laughs> so when you say constitutional right, are you saying like a right for future generations to have Exactly, yeah. What, 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 what I would compare it to is that there are currently in many state constitutions the right to a, 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 a good education. And we've seen how difficult that is to enforce. Um, it, it, but it has been enforced eventually. The problem is it usually requires citizens to you know, bring the case, they have to get into court, court has to hear it, have the standard, um, and, and it, it's not usually asserted against the private corporations, it's asserted against the government for failing to protect them or, or failing to provide the education. So I, I think that is sort of essentially the model, and that's even true with international human rights law too. You sue you're suing the government, the company, or I mean, sorry, the government for failing to protect, to protect that. Um, so, I mean, I think it could be feasible along that same way, as effective as that has been. Um, so, in Argentina, the federal constitution guarantees a constitutional right to a healthy environment, and the first, recently, like a couple of years ago, recently there was a lawsuit against the government um, for an area called Riachuelo, which is right on the main river that crosses the city. And it was w one of the most polluted areas in Buenos Aires. And the Supreme Court of Argentina upheld that citizens had that right to a healthy and clean environment. and. Ultimately, it had to go back and start cleaning up the area. So it's one way to um, engage in these issues, uh, but it remains to be seen yeah, if there is will for that. So say it's an interesting question of, of what the remedy would be too when you don't get there. Uh, good is obviously a it, you know it's in the eye of different beholders here. You know, I suppose to some degree, our air laws, for example, are supposed to do that. We have to reduce, um, um, 
you know, criteria pollutants, which are bad in large amounts, but we allow millions of tons to go into the air by an adequate margin of safety, query whether we do that or not. And for toxic pollutants, uh, by an ample margin of safety. So supposedly we're below the, the threshold. Uh, there's a big disagreement about that now. Um, you know, I always wonder, because there was sort of a mini experiment in this in 2001 in California. California botched its energy regulation. And all of a sudden, um, utilities were not able to pay for the gas-fired power out there. People, the other companies st stopped uh, in, uh, sending gas there for the power plants. There was low snow melt that year, so the hydro wasn't as big. And uh, the lights were flickering, and they were browning out different circuits. And the reaction of the public was, get the lights back on, the heck with the environment out there. So uh, Governor Davis, before he was uh, recalled, after just being reelected by a large margin, um, tried to uh, waive environmental laws. The EPA somewhat cooperated. He ordered uh, plants that were past their maximum emissions for the year in November to keep, gen to keep generating and keep producing more power. Uh, so it, there was a, and again, that was more of a, I wouldn't call it an emergency situation, but it was more of a tense situation. But the public seemed to, uh, I, I just don't know where the bounce back is going to be. The, the, the public was sort of saying, look, keep the lights on, keep the heat on, uh, do all these things, and we'll worry about the environment tomorrow. So I, I, as much as I am interested in it, I kind of wonder what the spectrum of views would be on it. So and good to one is not always good to another. As someone who's done, a, in my um, government attorney work, a lot of 1983 civil rights cases, there would be a lot of litigation. Um, and so you'd have to really, I mean, it, it's an interesting idea, but it, the, the result would be hard for courts to define. And um, but, but I think at some point we are going to have to start recognizing um, uh, th things that we hold in the common good, um, including our health and our environment, as something that is getting infringed upon and creating rights of action in that regard. But, but it will be a, it will be a sticky process. Mm -hmm. And you may find that you live in a country that has such a right. Stay tuned with the Juliana case because mm -hmm. we may have a right to a, at least a livable climate capable of supporting human life. Any other questions? Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you for being here today. Do, do you guys want to come up and say a few words? Okay, let's thank all of our panelists for a great panel. First of all, what an amazing day. Um, we explored how corporations have impacted climate change negatively, the inevitable role they're going to play in mitigating climate change, and ways to incentivize them to do so. To the students, I hope these panelists today inspired you and informed you. We are the next leaders, and these are the problems that we're going to have to continue to grapple with. Um, how lucky are we to have such strong shoulders to stand on and to have people here today that have paved the way for us to, to join the discussion and hopefully join the fight. So thank you. Before we close, we'd just like to thank Professor Scanlon for helping us organize this and just come up with the idea and keeping us on track. Professor Hoffman for advising us and supporting us. Also the moderators who took the time to help organize these panels and just keep the conversations going. And also Martina and her team for providing us with refreshments and making sure just everything came out really smoothly. Um, and we're just so grateful for Emily and uh, Jennifer for taking care of our tech, as well as everyone on BNG again. And also, thank you so much to the students at Law Review who have really helped make this event what it is today. And finally, last but not least, thank you to the panelists. Um, we can really tell that you put a lot of thought and preparation into each of your presentations. And um, it's really helped us have a really enriching day. You've all taught us something very valuable. So thank you. And that's the end of our symposium. Thank you, everyone.